Hello and welcome back to Lorefet Gaming Plays, Baldur's Gate 3. I'm your host, Lorefet. In this Baldur's Gate 3 build video, we're doing a Pure Powered Oath of Vengeance Deadly DPS build. As always, like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 videos like this. Do not forget to hit the notification bell so be updated and much more. So, here's the pros and cons of this build. Pros, your smites are really powerful. Number one. Number two, your Oath of Vengeance abilities are really nice. I mean, come on, you get Hunter's Mark, which adds to your DPS, which is good. Another thing is you could definitely use Heavy Play, and you have high hit points with this build. And uh, your two-handed weapons, you're going to be a beast with that. Only a few disadvantages is uh, follows, your spell slot goes, all of it. Yeah, your DPS gets down a, a little bit, like probably 25%. And another thing in mobility at times... Yeah, it's not that great unless you use Misty Step quite a bit. Now, another thing at this vanish with the Oath of Vengeance, they are really strict on their tenets. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead, uh, go to the leveling process and say goodbye bye to that big old MFR. Now it is time to go over the races and character creation. Now, uh, please note if you have Minthara in your party, she's already an Oath of Vengeance Paladin. This will be perfect for her, in fact. Now, for now, I'm just uh, demonstrating, of course, the character I see before you. Then I'll use my own Path of Devotion character to switch to Vengeance just for the level 2 to 12 process. Let's start with the races. And once again, Mithara is great for this build. Now, uh, first of all, I like the Tieflings. They have 9 meters per turn, which is good. Now, another thing is Dark Vision see up to 12 meters. And uh, last but not least is Hell's Resistance. You take uh, half damage from fire. You also have fire resistance, which is a double bonus. Zariel T. Flinch, you uh, get this level 0 spell, gain advantages on intimidation and performance checks. You can be intimidating quite a bit with this build, and this is great for it. Pop the baby and talking, things will go your way. Honorable mention, by the way, the Wood Elves are good too for this build. Anyways, let's talk about the humans. Now, humans are base racial speeds 9 meters, which is very nice. Now, uh, Silver Militia, that's all right. Still the Halberds, they're all good weapons. Now, here's the main one that's coming up. That's number one reason to be a human. Human versatility. You gain an extra skill point. You heard me right, one extra. Let me go ahead and demonstrate with the soldier. And I'm gonna go change some skills. So, uh, let's see here. We'll pick our, let's see, normally what we pick, which is, uh, I say is intimidate, I should say persuasion. And, of course, uh, other things as well. Let's see. Yeah, let me make sure this is right. Yeah, yeah. Persuasion I pick and Insight. We get to pick one more. So I could say, hmm, I could pick Deception number one. Or I could pick Performance if I feel like it. You see? Yeah. The, the human gives you an extra skill. That's why it's a nice bonus. Next up is the Gith Yankee. They're the underdog race. They're actually good for this build. Astral Knowledge gain proficiencies in all skills of a chosen ability. Once per long rest, but this is very good. Now they get a level zero spell, Mage Hands, which you pick up objects or move around it. And that's good. Also, they get Misty Step later on. Base racial speed is 9 meters, which is great. And of course, they're a martial prodigy, which is, includes great swords, one of them, which is nice. Now, uh, honorable mention, I'll say grade door, if you want to be a gold door for hit points, that's fine, but this race is better. Half Orcs, 9 meters per turn. Like everybody else. They get dark vision. That's good. Now, uh, next thing they uh, do get is Rentless Endurance. If you're down, you pop up with one hit point. Once per long rest. This is great. Savage Attack. So when you land critical hit, you roll extra weapon damage, which is great. <laughs> so I'll probably say Zariel Tiefling or Half Orc to go. Now, uh, for our classes, we get Lay on Hands. It's like a heal, which is good. Divine Sense gain advantages on attack rolls, and we get to channel our oaths. So we pick Oath of Vengeance. This is what we do get, actually. Let me try to get that. Inquisitor's Might. So you or your allies' weapons deal additional two radiant damage and can daze enemies for one turn. This is actually real good. If you daze your enemies, they won't be able to hit you for much and such. And there's your uh, tents. We'll go over those a little bit. There's only two of them that's important, but they're hardcore. So let's go to the backgrounds. As for backgrounds, I'm going to say only two I think it's great. Soldier, because of Athletics and Intimidation, it'll cover that. And History and Persuasion. I say Soldier's the way to go. 
Now, ability points are about similar to my other Paladin build, which is Oath of Devotion. We're going to put Strength at 17 because uh, when we get to level 8, we'll put one point into that. And Constitution Dexterity, we'll have to keep at 10. No choice on that. It'll be average. Constitution, we'll keep at 13. We'll boost it up to 14 when we get a leveling up. Now, Intelligence, we'll keep at 8. That's going to be our weak spot. Wisdom, 10. So, we'll be average good enough for the story. And Charisma, last but not least, will be 16, which is going to be great for this build. As for skills, I would probably say is Athletics, Intimidation, Persuasion, and Insight's the way to go. Now, if you're a human, add Deception or Performance to that. I'd probably say Deception's the best way on that end. And that should definitely do it for all the skills and such. So let's uh, go ahead and level up our character from, you guessed it, 2 to 12. So let's do this. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, level up. Many of the spells are the same as the other two oats. Now, except so for your oath breaker, you get a whole bunch of different things. Still, let's uh, go over each and every one of them. And yes, paladins get to choose a fighting style regardless of any oath they are. So uh, let's uh, go over the first thing we're going to go over is your spell slot. Now we get our uh, level 1 spell slot, which is good. We get Divine Smite, which is weapon damage, plus 2d8 Radiant, which is a good smite. You do a lot of damage with that. And you get a reaction version to it. So when you do a reaction, boom, you smite. Now if you miss any of those, you don't use a spell slot. You hit, you, you, lose, you use a spell slot, and you also get a critical hit as well on that. Now command is force a creature to flee, move closer, drop their weapons. This is a nice crowd control to forcing an enemy to do what you want them to do. Compelling duel, it'll force an enemy to attack you only. If they attack anybody else, they get a disadvantage. It's like a nice taunt, I'll uh, say. Healing, you heal 4 to 11 hit, uh, hit points, close range, not bad. Now another thing yeah, you uh, do get, this is a smite, wrathful smite. You do weapon damage plus 1d6 psychotic. You frighten your foes. If they are frightened, they have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, and they cannot move. It's a great smite to scare foes. Bless, uh, you think anybody hits with this is 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws, up to three targets, which is good. Divine Favor, uh, your weapon deals an additional one to four radiant damage. Good to start out with. Heroism makes yourself immune to fright and gain five temporary hit points. It's a concentration spell, so it's very good. Protection from good and evil protects your allies from attacks. Of course, aberrations, celestials, elementals, phase, fiends, and undead. That means uh, whoever's hit with it cannot be charmed, frightened, and possessed. Also, creatures against uh, you will have a disadvantage. Smear, 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 uh, Searing Smite, this is weapon damage plus fire. You get to put them on fire. Now, Zariel Tieflings get that for free as well, which is uh, good. It's a good smite. Shield of Faith, this will give you a creature plus 2 AC, which is not bad. It's another concentration spell. That's the only downside. Thunder Smite, uh, this does is uh, weapon damage plus 2d6, and it also pushes your, your target away for 3 meters. For fighting styles, we are picking great weapon fighting. So if we roll a 1 or 2 dice with a two-hand melee weapon, then a dice is re-rolled once more. That is very good, by the way. We'll focus on that for this build, which is two-hand weapons. You're going to be getting a lot of them. First, we're putting in Searing Smite. We're putting the other two Smites, which is Wrathful and Thunderous Smite. We're also going to go ahead and put Cure Wounds just in case we're in Deep Doo-Doo or something like that. And you can put in Bless. That's nice. Compelling Duel. That's a good one. And Command. Also Divine Favor as well. I'm going to do Divine Favor this way. We just uh, go ahead and use our Evocation spell to do a little bit more boost. Or Compelling Duel. Either one are uh, good. You can always change your spells. Now we're at level 3 and we get a few things. So here we go. We get in there a level 1 spell slot, we get divine health, so we're basically immune to diseases affecting you, which is good. Abjure Emni, Frightens an Emni, they have to have they have a disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls and cannot move. Fiends and Undead already have disadvantage on this as well. This is a good move to really do on foes. Pop this on a foe, like for example, Undead, and then go have at them, which are a melee weapon. Uh, another thing, Vow of Empty, gain advantage on attack rolls against an Emni. So we could pop this. We have advantage on uh, attacking them. We also get Bane as well. So whoever gets hit with Bane, they have 1d4 penalty to attack rolls and saving throws. 
Hunter's Mark, uh, this does is uh, marks a creature of your quarry, deals additional uh, whatever damage your weapon attack is. Now, a target dies, you get to reapply it again. It has concentration, but it is very good. Let's see here, for example, you could target, say, a Mind Flayer. And as a Zariel Tiefling, you get a uh, Searing Smite. For uh, preparing a spell, I'm going to go ahead and do uh, Ear Blessed. That's a one choice. Or the other one, Divine Favor. Like I said before, you could change these spells after you level up. Now we're at level four. Every level of four, we get ourselves a feat. First, we get Layer Hand Charges, which is uh, good. So we can heal others or ourselves. Let me uh, go ahead and keep, keep command there. That is a good one to uh, use. Yeah, we'll uh, leave it there. If you want to, bless us the way if you don't have Shadow Heart in your party. Now, honorable mention is Savage Attacker. It, you, re you roll two dices and it'll take the highest. Good for uh, constant smiting. I like Great Weapon Master because of a few reasons. When you land a critical hit on or kill a target, you get an extra attack as a bonus action. That is very good as long as you don't use a bonus action up. Then you go at it again. Unfortunately, you take a minus five penalty to attack rolls with heavy melee weapons, two-handers, in other words. However, the uh, bonus on that is you gain a plus ten damage bonus, so it's minus five attack on the rolls, plus uh, ten on the bonus. That will even out uh, good. Ding, level five, everyone. So uh, let's see what we get. We get some new spells, and we get level one and two spell slots, and we get an extra attack. So. Instead of one attack we do per round, we do two. Now, this doesn't stack with the other extra attacks, unfortunately, but still it is a great feat. We get free. A, this does is heal your allies, so you get five temporary hit points, which is uh, good. And uh, let's see what else we got. Branding Smite, this does radiant damage plus weapon damage. Also marks anybody who likes to go invisible. Great against rogues or anybody else who loves to abuse any form of invisibility. Less restoration, this will cure the following. Disease, poison, paralysis, and blindness. Good spell to have in case you fight against foes who constantly use those things. Magic weapon, infuse a weapon with arcane energy. The weapon becomes a magical plus one weapon, which is bonus attack rolls and damage rolls. That's great with ever-burning blade if you're still using that. Otherwise, uh, go pick something else. Protection poison, this will cure poisons and also give you a, a buffer against it. Now, whole person, when you hold a humanoid enemy, they can't move or anything like that. You got still have to focus on concentration. However, you'd be able to critical hit against them. Great to smite after them. Misty Step, this is a nice teleportation spell. It's always prepared so you can teleport around so this way you don't run. Yeah, you go after the runners. Zario Tieflings get the branding smite and other races get something as well. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take out the uh, poison. I'm going to take out that one as well. Let's go ahead and put some of the uh, branding smite. If I'm still like using uh, other uh, non plus one weapons, I'll uh, go with that. Now we're at level six. So after level six, we'll be halfway through the cap. And uh, we gave ourselves this Aurora Protection. Kneel by allies, gain a bonus to saving throws. That'll probably depend on your charisma. Good to have. And let me see. Okay. We'll uh, keep that there. Lesser restoration. That's uh, very uh, good. If we wanted to, we could switch that out or uh, something like that. Again, you can use Blessed if you uh, want. Now at level 7, we're starting the latter ha half of the uh, levels. We gain ourselves a level 2 spell slot. And this is what we gain as well. Relentless Avenger. So when you hit an enemy with the opportunity to attack, your movement speed... Gets increased by 4.5 meters. So if they try to run away, you're going after the runner. This is uh, great to do. Let's get rid of protection from evil. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring this one uh, back. That should definitely uh, do it. So let's uh, go ahead and level up again to, you guessed it, level 8. Now we're at level 8. Now I know strength and uh, constitution is uneven. We'll uh, take care of that issue. And let me uh, go ahead and put aid there. That's always uh, useful or uh, bless. Yeah, bless is fine. We'll leave it there. Now, ability points, we're spreading them out. So we're going to do strength at 18. Don't worry, there's an item that will boost it up to 20 afterwards. And we'll leave Constitution at 14 for much more hit points. And that's about it for the strength and, uh, course, Constitution Department. Now at level 9, so let's uh, go ahead and see what we do get. All right, we get ourselves a level 3 spell slot. And here we go. War and Vitality, when this uh, is in effect... 
You can cast Restore Vitality as a bonus action to heal your, you and your party members. It's good. Binding Smite. This does is it'll blind your uh, foes. Besides, it does your Radiant and uh, Weapon Damage, which is good. Now, uh, next up is Crusader Mantle. What it does is everybody gets 1 to 4 Radiant Damage, which is uh, very uh, good if you want to buff everybody up with that. Now, another one's Daylight. It does is uh, brightens the area up real nicely, so this way it exposes anything that's obscure. Also uh, great against, you uh, guessed it, certain encounters or certain areas. If you want to go uh, use that or abuse it. Elemental weapons. Imbue a weapon with elemental power. It receives plus one bonus to attack rolls and 1d4 damage of your elemental choice. Good against if you're having a hard time against certain elementals. Remove curses. Remove uh, curses and hexes affecting you. There are some certain instances later on in the game you'll abuse that. Revive uh, this revive spell will revive your characters by one hit point. Now haste. This is just like the haste potion and spell. You gain action plus two AC and become much more faster. Oath of Vengeance characters get to cast that freely. Now protection from energy. You get yourself a resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage. So this is nice again against certain foes you're facing. I decided to do blinding smite and uh, let me uh, make sure I organize this. Let's go ahead and do magical weapon and blinding. Uh, Blind Smite, that'll be uh, good enough uh, there. Again, you could change it after you level up. Now we're at level 10, so things are starting to look really good. So we get ourselves another lay on hand charges. And uh, of course, we also uh, get, let's go over there, Aurora of Courage. So when we pop this, anybody near the Paladin cannot be frightened. So these Auroras, if you get knocked out, yeah, you lose the Aurora. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this one there, uh, War and Vitality. That's a nice one to abuse and uh, use. Now at level 11, uh, so we get a few things. We get ourselves another level 3 spell slot, and you uh, guessed it. Improved Divine Smite. So when we uh, Divine Smite, our melee weapon deals an additional 1 to 8 Radiant Damage, which is uh, good. So we get a bonus in that. Let's uh, go ahead and get rid of this. I'll uh, put down Remove Curse. Yeah, there's uh, one spot in the game, and also uh, this build, you're going to use that. I'll explain onto it when we get to the permanent stat boosts. So let's go to level 12. Ding, level 12, we're at the final level. So we get ourselves another feat. This is it here. And let's go ahead and prepare spells. Let's see here. Okay, I could do Daylight. I could do anything else. Yeah, Crusader's Mantle, that's uh, good enough. Now for feet, we're going to put two points in the Charisma. We'll get that to 18. Now, when we do the permanent ability score boosts, strength and charisma will be both at 20. Unless we do something else with that. So, that should be it for leveling up. Next up are the Oath of Vengeance rules. Since this is an Oath of Vengeance build, there are some tenets you have to follow no matter what. Spot the greater evil and go after it no matter what. You have to fight it. You avoid fighting your Oath Breaker. Simple as that. Here's another rule. Strike first. Strike hard. No mercy for the wicked. In fact, kill the wicked. You don't kill the wicked. You decide to spare an evil or wicked person. You're an Oathbreaker. Break any of these and you're an Oathbreaker. Now, that is for another build unless it is out of course said build. Still, this is a Oath of Vengeance Paladin type of build, so we're focusing on that, not an Oathbreaker. That's another time. Now, next up are the permanent ability score boosts. There are three ways to permanently boost your ability score, so I'll go over each and every one of them. So let's go ahead and start with Act 1. There's one in each act, by the way. If you decide to spare Auntie Ethel by, of course, dropping your hit points below 10, then what happens is you get a plus 1 ability score item of your choice. Now, avoid you doing this since your Oath of Vengeance. In other words, if you take the deal, that's most likely you become an Oath Breaker. Let someone else do it, like for instance, Shao Heart or Lizelle, and then have them pick Charisma if you can go that route. Now, here's another one. You're going to need a Steron in Act 2 for this. In other words, you cannot have a Steron either be killed somehow permanently, or he leaves the party. So you got to play nice with him for a while. In Act 2, with a Steron in your party at the Moonrise Towers, yeah, play it cool there. There's an NPC named Ajara. She is a drow. She not only sells potions, but also some great end game items. So you talk to her, give her uh, your blood, and then she'll ask Asteron to bite her. Have him to do it. Asteron's going to be a little bit grumbling and at disapproval of this. However, you get yourself a nice two, plus two strength potion. Once that happens, drink that sucker and there's your plus two strength. 
Now with this spell, you go from 18 to 20 instantly like that. Number, and number three, this is the most important one in my mind, the mirror loss. Now there are, here's the deal about the mirror loss. When you first go to mirror loss, you got to pass two intelligence checks. Either religion or arcana, most likely religion. Once you do pass that, and then what happens is you have to pick seven choices. Do not pick the seven choice by being deceptive. If you're being deceptive, Shard knows you get nothing out of all this. So you pick one to six stats you want to lose. I'd probably say just lose some dexterity. No harm, no foul, right? Once you do that, then you have three options by two hidden charisma checks. And by the way, some people go to Mirror Lost to respect their characters with very high intelligence and very high charisma. So here's the uh, options. Option one, you pass both checks, you get a plus one charisma. If that's the case with Auntie Ethel, you combine that, then I would probably say get plus two strength on that. Now, uh, number two, for some reason, you don't get the plus one charisma or you didn't do Auntie Ethel at all. You get just your plus two stat, your choice. Pick charisma, that'll put it up to 20. Yeah, this build will have strength and charisma exactly at 20. Unless you do the Auntie Ethel method with the plus one charisma on the mirror loss, then yeah, that'll be up to 22. And number three, this will rarely happen with a paladin. You get nothing, not a zilch out of the choice. You just get the loss and that's it. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate both Act 2 and 3. I need to do Act 1 because I was trying not to be an Oathbreaker at the time with my Oath of Devotion character. Now, this lovely NPC here, she sells some great things. And what you need to do is have a stare around, bite her. And once this happens, you get yourself a very nice plus 2 strength potion. Half your character drink it. So if your strength is at 18, it will be up to 20 automatically so you get plus two strength off the bat which is uh really good let's go to the mirror loss at the mirror loss after you take in of course your two intelligence checks religion or can depending on which route you went and took your loss in this case you should take dexterity by the way remove curse will remove the loss of course you get your stats back anyhow here are the ability scores you get from one through six the uh first one is plus one, uh, two strength. Yeah, you gain plus two strength. Number uh, two is plus two dexterity. Number three is plus two constitution. Number four is plus two intelligence. And number five is plus two wisdom. And number six is plus two charisma. Now for this, if you did the Auntie Ethel and you really got lucky on the plus one charisma, getting a special message, go for strength. Otherwise, definitely go for charisma. With this build, you're going to try at least to get the 20 strength, unless you really got lucky, then 22 strength and 20 charisma will help you out greatly. And that's about it for the mirror loss. And yeah, remember to remove curse after you are done with the mirror loss once again. Now, let's go ahead and do the before and after permanent stat boosts throughout the game, as if you're level 12 at the cap. Now before, if you've done nothing at all, use none of the items and such, you get Strength 18, Dexterity 10, Constitution 14, Intelligence 8, Wisdom 10, Charisma 18. Now uh, after, now your, your Strength will be exactly at 20. Now it will be at 22 if you do the Auntie Ethel Charisma item you use and the bonus uh, Mirror Loss Charisma boost right up there, which is 1 plus Charisma. Dexterity 10, Constitution 14, Intelligence 8, Wisdom 10, and Charisma 20. Now, uh, you did get 20 another way by doing the Auntie Ethel method, and the, you got l really lucky at the Mirror Loss with the bonus Charisma. Then uh, put that strength at 22. That's about it for before and after. Let's go ahead and talk about Tadpole Powers. I did separate the Tadpole Powers into two categories, before and after, using the Astral Touch Tadpole. So, let's go ahead and start with the before. Here are the tadpole powers before you decide to use the Astral Touch tadpole. Favorable beginnings, boost attack rolls, or gives you advantage in dialogues. I'm going to be honest, both of those are perfect for Paladin, especially the dialogues. And we need that attack boost roll since we have a minus 5 with our two-handed weapon. It'll even that out, especially on tough foes. Cold of weak, when a creature has few hit points less than your tadpole powers, it dies instantly. So for example, you have six tadpole powers and your foe has five hit points or less, that foe dies instantly. Now here's another good one, Psionic Backlash. When a foe casts a spell, you do 1d4 damage per caster level. This is real nice, this is psychotic damage. 
and uh, it'll annoy those casters. Even I killed a caster with that one time. Force tunnel, charge fours, and draws no attack of opportunity when doing so. This is like a nice charge bonus action if you decide to do my flare quest, or it has to be your normal action. Still, you charge four, you move close to your foe. That's what you want to do. Drain ability, attack that could either drain st uh, strength, which is a melee attack. You could be doing that quite a bit. Or dexterity with range for your first attack on said foe. Now, yeah, those both are really good options. So let's go ahead and do the after now. After you consume the Astral Touch Tadpole and have a nice craving for brains, here are some recommended abilities. Number one, Black Holt, OP AOE attack. Now this is like five charges before long rest. I use this in late game and let me tell you, it's a very nice Emni clear. I killed many tough Emnies with that as well. It does a lot of damage. Fly, gain ability to fly. It's not worse, you zip around the battlefield and it's uh, great to uh, use and abuse. Repulsor, this is an AOE pushback damage type of ability. So if there's too many folks coming by, you push them back and then go after one you want to uh, kill. Next up is free cast. Next ability, spells or anything else is free of charge to use. So for example, you want to use a level 3 spell slot for Divine Smite. However, you don't want to waste a spell slot. Free cast it and then uh, do that smite. And then, of course, you can use it again. It's another great way to get an extra smite out of this. That's it for Tadpole Powers. Let's go over Gear of Ice. I did split the equipment into two categories. Gear you should get by an Act 1 before entering the Shadow Curse Lands. And number two, Endgame Gear. Now, please note this is a very similar to my Oath of Vengeance type of build for the equipment. Since it is a Paladin class, this will actually work really well with the Oath of Vengeance. So let's go ahead and start by the end of Act 1 equipment. Helmets, aka headgear for equipment you want to get by the end of Act 1. Let's start with that. Grim Skull Helm, attacker cannot land a critical hit on you. This is really good, extremely. Gain fire resistance. Now, if you're Zariel Tiefling, that stacks, which is good. If not, this is wonderful. Gains use of Hunter's Mark. Now, Hunter's Mark does, uh, once again, Whatever damage you do, you do one to D6 extra, which is nice. So no worries, you don't have to actually use the spell. It's once per long rest, but this is good. Now, Grim drops this at the Amanti Forge in Act 1. This is a tough fight for Act 1, possibly the toughest fight in, in the, I should say, an entire act. So you definitely want to do that, because if you do that, and you have access to the Forge to make some other good things as well. Here's an alternative for those of you who don't want to go that route. The Haste Helm. Gains momentum for three rounds. That is 1.5 movement speed per round, which is good. Lock just in the Blight Village in Act 1. You can easily jimmy the lock or have a stair round to do that. Last but not least is the Helmet of Smiting. When you use a Smite, you gain hit points equal to your Charisma Modifier. So, for example, your Charisma Modifier is 3. You gain 3 plus hit points. Also, on the upside, too, you gain plus 1 Constitution saving throws. This, uh... This is in a chest in a saloon I outpost in the other dark in Act 1. So let's move to the next set of equipment. Here's some chest equipment. Amantite Splint Armor reduces all damage by 2. When foe hits you, they get a minus 1 attack for 3 rounds. Cannot be hit by critical hits as well. Amantite Forge under dark in Act 1. You gotta defeat Grim, then make sure you use the Mithril Ore and the Splint Armor Mold in order to go ahead and make this. It's really good. Now, here's a nice alternative in case you don't want to do that or you're too lazy. Chainmail plus one or full plate armor, which is, you know, I mean, normal. This is in many places in Act 1 that drops this. Mountain Pash, the Druid's Grove, you uh, name it, you can buy it as well. Here's some gloves, and I did a list of about two of them. Gloves of Dexterity, your Dexterity is set to 18. And the best part is you gain a plus one attack. This is like really useful also if you're going to be doing some pickpocking you don't have a stare on your party. Or I say more like lock picking. If you want to go that route as well. Get the Yankee Crush in the Mountain Pass. And Merchant Jira. Yeah, she sells that in Act 1. Buy before attack. And in fact, buy everything from her because she has some great Act 1 stuff there too. Here's a nice alternative if you haven't got to that point yet or you feel like this is better. Gloves of Groveling Underdog, two or more foes that surround you, you gain advantage on melee attacks. Also, you gain a plus one strength saving throw. Door Razlin uh, does have the key. You kill him for it, you can steal it. After that, you go into his treasure room behind the throne room and loot up the treasure crates in there. That's where the gloves are at exactly. 
Next are the boots. Now, please note, this is the Boots of Speed. This is totally different than your Baldur's Gate series and your Neverwinter Night series where you constantly have haste. So here we go. Now, this version of Boots of Speed, when it's used, your movement speed is double for one round. So if your movement speed is like, for example, 9 meters, bump that up to 18 meters, which is good. This will use a bonus action. That's good as well. You'll lose your, of course, great uh, weapon, critical hit, move, but still, that movement speed is nice. Thola has this item in Act 1, Underdark, at the Mitochondria Village. That's the Mushroom People. Either convince her to uh, go ahead and give it to you or do a request to cure her. Either way, get these boots ASAP. Here's a nice alternative, everyone. Boots of Jinnile Striding. The wearer's movement speed is unimpeded by difficult terrain. Blurk sells this in the Underdark Act 1. Same place where you met Thurla. He sells a bunch of things there. Clean out his inventory. You'll thank me later. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing for the cloaks. If you find any, go ahead and you buy it and use it. Necklaces. Here we uh, go. Amulet of Branding. Foes get hit with Branding Spell. That means they take double damage in melee. So this is really good. Now, the same person that sells you the Gloves of Dexterity at the Get the Yankee Crush in the Mountain Pass, Merchant Jira, she uh, drops this. This is a drop item, so go ahead and kill her for it after you clear her inventory in Act 1. Here's a nice alternative amulet I like. This is more of a healing type, but here we go. Amulet of Restoration. Gain used to mass healing word and healing word. Dirtless Bone Cloak sells this at the Mitochondria Colony under Dark in Act 1. Same place where you met Thurla, and same place where you met Blurg, that ultimate merchant. Buy everything from her as uh, well. She does sell some good al alchemy items. That's a tip from me. So uh, let's move on to the next set of equipment. We're at the ring, so I decided to pick the top four rings in my mind for, of course, melee classes like this build here. Crusher Band, movement speed is increased by 3 plus meters. Ear Steel or Loot Crusher to get this item at the Gauntlet Camp in Act 1. If you want to side with the Absolute, stealing is the way to go. Bring a stair run for that part. Caustic Band, you deal plus 2 acid damage to foes. There's a the Bone Cloak sells this at the Mount Colony under Dark and Act 1. Yeah, clean out our inventory, like I said before. Now, here's some good alternatives in case you can't get one or the other, or someone else is using either one of those. Ring of Absolute Force, use a Thunder Wave spell, 6 to 12 damage. If you Absolute Brand it, add a plus 1 extra to that. Sergeant Thrin in the Grim Forge under Dark 2, that's what we call it, in Act 1, ear drops this. So go ahead and uh, get someone else to kill him, or you do it yourself. The Sparks Wall cannot be electrocuted. Electric resistance also decreased as well. In the Arcade Tower Basement Under Dark in Act 1. Yeah, raid the tower. There's some good stuff there. Here are some weapons. These are two handed weapons. Sussar Great Sword. This is a plus one great sword. Silences target on hit. Really nice against spellcasters. Here's how to get it. Finish the quest called Finish the Masterwork Weapon. You get the side quest at the Blythe Village. You're going to need the following two items. Sussar Bark, which is found in the Underdark. Look for an area that will silence your spells. Get the bark. Then get a plain great sword. In other words, a mundane one you buy from any vendor or you find in the world. Once you have those two, then go to the forge at the Blythe Village in Act 1 to find the two items there. You know the forge when you see it. And that's how you get the very powerful great sword. Now here's a nice alternative. Sword of Justice. This is a plus one great sword. Tears Protection, uh, when this person uh, equips this item, gives you a nice buff of two armor class. And to remove the sword, Anders at the Risen Road Toll House drops this. So you will have to expose Anders and you're forced to fight him. Now, this is a great way to make sure Karlak's in your party as well. Now, I decided to put this uh, weapon here, Everburn Blade. It's good to have if you uh, did kill the Commander Zok, which is a Cambonian demon. Or say devil more like it in the prologue yeah that's right that's before you land in act one so if you want to get that blade that's good bad news is it's not enchanted so you'll have to use magical weapon on it or use it yourself and then boom it's a plus one temporarily so that's about it for you uh guessed it two-handed weapons let's talk about ranged weapons i decided to do a selection of ranged weapons i regret actually not using these. I did buy them, but still, they're really good. Titan String Bow. This is a plus one long bow. This long bow does damage equal to your strength mod. So if your strength mod, for example, is four, well, attack four to the normal damage on that bow. Now, Brim in the Zenth 
Pete's hideout sells this in Act 1. After help. Now, the only way to access this is really just help out the Zents in their quest called The Missing Shipment. In other words, kill the gnolls. And once you do that, talk to the Zents. They'll give you directions on where the hideout is at. Talk to the doorman there. Convince them that you're friendly. Once that happens, you go through. And then, of course, after you talk to your leader, you have access to their inventory. That's how you do it. Now, here's another alternative, which I think is really good. Giant Breaker plus Heavy 1 Crossbow. Folks get a minus 1 attack for two rounds when they're hit. Now, same person sells the Titan String Bow. will also sell this as well, so you know what to do. All this is in Act 1, by the way. Anyways. Bow of the Banshee. This is another alternative I decided to add. Plus 1 Short Bow on hit. Possibly inflicts Frighten. So if your target's Frightened, you gain an extra 1d4 damage against said target when you hit him again. And here's who uh, drops this, or you could also buy it as well. Colsar Greymon in the Grim Forge Underdark 2, which I call in Act 1, has this. So definitely go ahead and get it. Peaceful Solution, definitely buy it. Violent Solution, kill him for it. Let's move on. Before I do go into Endgame gear, so please know about where the location at and act as well. So if it's in, for example, Act 2, make sure you get it in the area also before leaving said area and the axe so yeah don't leave without said item here we go for the helmets helmet of Bahrainian. this heals you two hit points per round by the way really nice plus one armor class and saving throws that's great here's the best part two of them coming up cannot be stunned and cannot be critical hit against both are wonderful defeat the wormway trials and the boss to get this in act three now, I decided to put two alternatives there in case you don't want to do that at all or you haven't reached that point. The Helldux Helmet can't see through normal and magical darkness. Great if you're a human, so remember that. Cannot be blinded at all. That's very good. Now, uh, plus two saving throws against spells. Where is immune to critical hits? Those two options are good. House of Hope in our lock room in Act 3. Yeah, go ahead, bust in that lock room and get the item. Here's another alternative. Sarah Fox Horn Helmet. Now, here's the uh, deal. You gain or increase vision uh, meters. In other words, this is great for uh, dark vision if you don't have it. Or if you have dark vision, you boost that up. Number of critical hits uh, rolls you need drops by one. So instead of, for example, 19 to 20 for a critical hit, now it's 18 to 20. Cannot be frightened. That's good. And plus one constitution save. You know who at the Murder Tribunal drops this in Act 3. So good idea to get it. So let's move on to the next set of equipment. Here's some cloaks you definitely want to get. Good idea to stock on these now. This uh, cloak is called Flesh Melter Cloak. When wearer gets hit, the attacker takes 1 to 4 acid damage. This is in a uh, Gleld chest in the House of Healing Morgue in Act 2. Do not leave this morgue without it. In fact, don't leave Act 2 without this. Here's a good alternative. Cinder Moth Cloak. Attacker takes burning damage, which is 1 to 4 fire damage per round. Opposite of the acid one, but still good. Now, uh, Ellis, I might mispronounce his name, Cyrus is in the Lower Sea Sewers in Act 3 drops this. He's with all the mud-type creatures, so yeah, good idea to murder him for it. Now we're on the chest pieces, so here we go. Health Dusk Armor can use heavy armor even if you're not proficient with it. When a caster spell hits you and then you make a save, caster takes burning damage, so it's like a feedback damage. Immune to burn, resistance, and fire. So if you're already a tiefling, for example, that resistance adds up greatly. Takes three less damages from all sources. This is absolutely good. You Raphael drops this in Act 3. You know when you uh, go ahead and meet him at some point in the game to fight him, of course, if you want to. In case you don't want to fight him, now here's the nice alternative piece of armor. Armor of Persistence. Damage reduced by 2, gain resistance... And Blade Ward automatically, so resistance is blunt piercing and slashing on Blade Ward and resistance as uh, well for which your save throws, if I remember correctly. Damien sells this in Act 3 in Lower City. It's at the Forge of the Nine. See him there? Buy it. And if Damien lives, that's great. Now, here's some gloves. Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength, plus one saving throws. Your strength is automatically set to 23, so if you have 24 strength, this will be kind of useless. Archives at the House of Hope in Act 3. Yeah, also uh, do steal the amulet there. We're going to talk about that in a bit. Legacy of the Masters is a good alternative. Plus 2 attack and damage rolls with weapons. Plus 2 strength saves. Damien sells this in Act 3, Lower City 
Uh, and that's where he sells it at. Same place where he bought the armor. I want to do an honorable mention. I had done in the other build. Bone, uh, bone spike gloves. Now, if you kill Strangler Luke and loot the gloves, this will ignore slashing, piercing, and blunt damage. So it's a nice uh, gloves to have in case you want to get the other two. Let's uh, go over the boots. Helldust boots cannot be moved by magical or normal means. Immune to difficult terrain. Now, that's really good. So, in other words, difficult terrain will be no problem with you. When you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to seed instead. Usually, your bonus reaction, or I say bonus action. This is all really good. Teleports to an area. When it does teleport, you do 2 to 16 fire damage in the area. Once, I think, prolonged rest or something like that. Lord Gortash's room has this in Act 3. Either steal the key from him or murder Lord Gortash for it. If you do the murder route, or in red, we'd be happy. Here's alternative boots of persistence. Gains freedom of movement and long stride. Yeah, in other words, with long stride, you get 3 plus meters. You can also get dex save plus 1. So uh, here's who uh, sells this. Damien sells this also in Act 3. Yeah, that's right. That's where you get the uh, other stuff there. So clean out his inventory, then steal his gold. I'm just saying. Here's some necklaces. Amulet of Greater Health. Constitution set to 23. Advantages on Constitution saving throws. In the archives at the House of Hope in Act 3. That's where you got the gloves of Hill Giant Strength at. So get the necklace as well. Here's a nice alternative. You should have this before this amulet. Surgeon's uh, Subjugation Amulet. When scoring a critical hit on a humanoid, the wearer can be paralyzed for two turns. After that, it's long rest before you use that again. And when they're paralyzed, you get to do some damage against them. Mouse Storm drops this at the House of Healing in Act 2. So here are uh, two options. Kill Mouse Storm directly and then loot the amulet or talk him into killing himself then loot the amulet. I did a talking route and I used Shadow Heart for that in case you don't want to go into a real combat situation. So let's get to the, you uh, guessed it, rings. Let's uh, go over the rings, Killer Sweetheart. When you kill a creature, your next attack roll will be a critical hit. Now this is once per long rest, but still, this is really useful, especially with this build. Self-same trial in the Gauntlet Shard in Act 2. Usually your clone drops this, so don't grab the Umbrella Orb until you get this powerful ring. Yeah, in fact, don't leave Act 2 without it. Ring of Regeneration. At the start of combat, you regenerate 1 to 4 hit points. Roland, or uh, in case he doesn't survive, someone else sells this in Act 3 at the Sorcerer's Sundries. Now, here's some two alternatives I decided to go ahead and use. Ring of Free Action. You ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained. Araj, uh, that is the Strength Potion NPC Lady, who also sells not only alchemy stuff, she sells some great endgame gear in Act 2 at the Moonrise Tower. So, play it cool in the Moonrise Towers in Act 2. Uh, get the strength potion and buy all of her, I should say, magical items. Here's another one. Risky ring. Gain advantages on attack rolls. Now, uh, on the other hand, disadvantage on saves. This is absolutely a great ring. So, if you have an issue with the minus 5 attack rolls with a great weapon, I should say feet, put this ring on. The same NPC that gives you the strength potion and also sells the ring of free action will sell this as well in Act 2. Again, Play it cool at the Moonrise Towers and clean out her inventory if you want to steal gold from her after. Here are some two-handed weapons. End game. Varinian's Giant Slayer on hit. Double your strength mod. So if your strength mod, for example, is 5, it will now be uh, 10 added to your, of course, attack. Avenge on creatures larger and above. So this is a great weapon. Plus 3 great swords. That's very good. So when you use Giant Form... You get 1d6 extra damage, 27 hit points temporarily, and your strength throw, uh, I say strength saving throws, have a nice advantage as well. This is dropped by the boss of the Wormway Trials in Act 3. You'll know who that boss is. Here's a nice alternative, Sword of Chaos. On hit, you regenerate 1 to 6 hit points. This is a plus 2 great sword, looted from you know who in the Murder Tribunal in Act 3. Honorable mention, there's a halberd in Act 2 that causes bleeding. A certain NPC, if you uh, get through a dialogue check, will also sell that as well. And uh, if you didn't bring Shaw Heart with you, there is a Shaw Merchant that will also sell you a nice, I say, Great Axe, which is a plus two Great Axe, and you summon a nice little Great Axe to help you in combat. Just going to mention those two weapons anyways. Let's get to the ranged weapons. 
For ranged weapons, they're usually used for runners mainly, but still, here we go. Dark fire short bow. This is a plus two short bow. Gain resistance to fire and ice. Can cast haste. So this is a free use of haste. Again, let's just like the haste spell. You get attack movement up increased by one. Uh, movement doubled. AC plus two and other uh, things as well. You just get a downside uh, after uh, that. Damien sells this in Act 2, so if you see him in Act 2, buy it. If you miss him, he can sell this in Act 3, so get it in Act 2. If not, you have to roll the dice on that if he has it. Now, here's a nice alternative, which I do love. Fabricated Alvarez, plus heavy two. Uh, this is a uh, plus two heavy crossbow. The illuminating shot fires a shimmering bolt that inflicts one turn of radiant orbs upon target. So, in other words, they'll get hamper on their uh, stats. Uh, this also deals 1d4 damage piercing. This does dazzling ray. Unleash a beam of brilliant light that blinds all creatures in its path. Just like the sun ray spell minus the ultimate damage on it. Now, uh, this ends uh, until the spell ends. You can also recast it over and over again. Now, casting it may burn yourself as well. This will last 10 turns, just like the sunbeam spell. On saves, targets still take half damage from Dazzling Ray. Now, uh, Dazzling Ray deals in its full damage 2d10. That's Radiant. Lord Gortash drops this in Act 3, so if you're in a murder mood, go ahead and kill him. Now, uh, there's a bow also in uh, Act 3 as well. A uh, certain NPC who's Karlak's friend, if you want to buy it, that's good because it gives you one less roll to get a critical hit. Again, like for example, your critical hits are 19 to 20 on the boat. It'll be dropped down to 18 to 20. Just going to mention that one quickly. That's about it for equipment. So let's go over potions, elixirs, and oils. We're going to go ahead and go over the potions, elixirs, and oils. Now, things are a little bit different with this build than the Path of Devotion one. I added the elixir of bloodlust because I felt like that was important as well. So let's first start off with you uh, guessed it, the potions. Here's the deal on potions. As always, get healing potions of all type. That is a must in case Shadow Heart or Jahir is ever down your healer. Then you uh, definitely want to use that. Very important. Yeah, use it throughout the game. Just saying. Potion of Haze. Gain an extra action plus 2 AC. Advantage on deck saving throws and double movement speed. Downside is you're going to be a little bit slowed down after, of course, the uh, use of the haste potion is done. But still, the haste potion is really OP and many people use it for hard encounters. I used it for quite a bit of the counters in the game. Now, another thing I'm going to go ahead and say is potion of flying, same as the fly spell. If you need to get somewhere far or move ahead in the battlefield, this is the potion. Honorable mention, potion of vaulting. This will boost up your jump, which is not bad at all. So let's get to elixirs. Now for elixirs, I did list quite a few of them. Elixirs of Vigilance, gaining plus five bonus initiative and cannot be surprised at all. This is similar to the alert feat. This is really nice. So if you face an encounter knowing folks will like to ambush you, drink one of these. This way you don't get surprised. Elixir of the Colossus this is one of my favorite ones throughout the game. This will increase your size, gain strength, saving throws, and advantages, and it does one extra 1d4 weapon damage. Now, what it doesn't tell you is when you increase in size, you get to jump into farther places and much more higher. Now, Elixir of Viciousness increases your chance to land a critical hit. So, for example, your Barberian Greatsword is a critical hit 19 to 20. Drink this. You only have to get 18 to 20. Elixir of Cloud Giant Strength set your strength to 27. Now there's a lesser version of that strength potion that's before this one. Drink that one as uh, well. Last but least, the elixir of blood loss. Now upon killing your foe, you gain five temporary hit points and an extra bonus action, which is really good. I mean, you get to abuse that like crazy. Now let's get to the oils. The oil accuracy, this is a coat weapon type of oil. When you coat your weapon, you gain a bonus of plus two in attack rolls. This is really nice to have. Especially if you're minus 5 on attack rolls, it'll drop it down to minus 3. Wizard Bane Oil, it's target receiving minus 3 penalty to spell attack rolls and spell save DC. That's right, this is great towards casters. Also, the set caster gets hit with this, gets disadvantage on saving throws for maintaining concentration for 2 turns. So, if this uh, caster likes to, you know, do, I should say, chain lightning, try to maintain it, pop Wizard Bane Oil, then hit him with your weapon. And that wizard will probably most likely lose concentration on chain lightning. 
Uh, last but not least, any poisons you get your hands on as well as a last dish effort. The purple worm toxin, definitely save that for certain boss fights. That's it for potions, elixir, and oils. Now stay tuned for the combat demonstration of this build. When you do start out, things are very tough as you see before you. Definitely get used to your spells and smites. So let's uh, go ahead and use one of the smites. I think, let's see here, this one will uh, do. He has 21 hit points and one hit. He dies. Yep, that's right. He died big time. Since I cannot reach one of those, if that happens, go ahead and cast your spells. Like, for example, we're just have some fun with the Bane spell. Definitely uh, prepare yourself as at uh, all times. Make sure you know the situation. Sometimes it may not go your way. Then you have to fix that. So let me uh, cast this. And that should uh, definitely uh, do it. Yeah, let's get in closer. Yeah, we're utilizing banks this way. They'll do uh, less damage against me next time. And uh, there we go. Let's go into Act 2. Now, when everything's right and you have a good team at times, you'll definitely know what to do. Like, for example, this greedy Thorm. Yeah, we're about to uh, go ahead and kill her big time with our character. So, let's uh, get out of the way of this. Yeah, she's going to try to do that. And, yeah, she did opportunity attack. Because of that, I'm a reckless Avenger. In other words... I get more movement speed and I get to wreck more uh, foes. So yeah, take advantage of the Oath of Vengeance passive and of course abilities you could definitely use and abuse. Yeah, while we're finishing off the weaker foes, what we are going to go ahead and do is uh, go ahead and one shot her with our Paladin. Yep, let's uh, go ahead and take her out. Let's see here. Do a nice Divine Smite and she should be dead. Definitely put everything together. Know when to use abilities. Know when to just uh, do a normal attack. Here's some final advice before I end this build video. You're going to start a little bit slow, but once you get to, you uh, guess at level 4 and 5, you're going to start wrecking things like crazy. Your greater weapon will always be beast for this build. Your smites, yeah, that's going to be your main tool. Do take advantage of using some of your spells and abilities with the Oath of Vengeance because they are really nice. Especially the haste, the hunter's mark, or at times when you start out, Bane does work as uh, well. Your Oath of Vengeance passives are always great and wonderful. You do a lot of damage with it. You can wreck many foes along the uh, way. Other than that, uh, definitely make sure you do follow the tenets because with the Oath of Vengeance, you have to take out evil at all times. And if you spot evil, you got to kill evil. In other words, if you want to break your oath without, of course, the penalty part, then have someone else uh, go ahead and do that. Last but not least, always prepare for the best and always prepare for the uh, worst. And when it comes to it, don't be afraid of using your ranged weapons, just in case you have a serious runner. And uh, yeah, uh, one more thing I forgot to mention. Abuse your tadpole powers. They're there for a good reason, especially for this build. This is it from my Baldur's Gate 3 Pure Paladin Oath of Vengeance Deadly DPS build video. This is Lorefent signing off. Thanks for watching and have a great day or night. Do please stay safe. Please subscribe to my channel for more classic and modern Dungeons and Dragons walkthroughs, builds, guides, and more just like this. If you like what you see, then uh, go ahead and pick my suggestion on the upper left-hand corner or YouTube suggestion on the bottom left-hand corner. I'm going to go ahead and relax in this nice chair.